want you to take out your Bibles. Turn to Matthew 22. Twenty-two. We're going to start at verse fifteen. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him, Jesus, in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, "We know you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by men because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then." What is your opinion? Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius. Whose portrait is this and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. And to God, what is God's? When they heard this, they were amazed. So they left him and went away. In case you've been living under a rock for the last year or so, we have an election coming up pretty soon. And um, there's a lot of anxieties about that. And um, just in my conversations with people, even just within myself, there's it's kind of a it's kind of a anxious time. And the Bible has some things to say to us about it, and I think that we need to take a look at what those are. At least the next couple Sundays here. There's a couple difficulties though when we're taking the the Bible says and applying it to our situation today. First of all, is that in the Bible there was no such thing as democracy. So this whole notion that we can elect our leaders, that did not really exist. There was a little time in Athens when there was some democracy, but it was just like a brief moment. So the world really hadn't, doesn't even know what democracy was. You had rulers and they were appointed for you. You didn't have any say in that. And usually if you tried to make a stink about something, uh, you'd get thrown in jail or in prison or something. So... It's, it was a very different time when it came to politics between now and then. And the other thing that makes it a little bit difficult is that Jesus almost never talked about politics. There were just maybe a couple times when he did. This was one of them. Is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? And to everyone's amazement, as it says here, Jesus said to pay taxes to Caesar in verse 21. Now, we've heard this before, most of us have, so it's not so surprising to us what Jesus responds here. But for most people, at least at that time, that would have been pretty startling. Pay taxes to Caesar. Jesus said this, we have to consider the audience here. Who is Jesus talking to? Jesus said this to people who absolutely hated their government. They didn't just dislike it. They didn't just disagree. They hated their rulers. They hated them. There was no such thing as, in God we trust, on on their coins at all, like we have. That That was not a national motto. There was no pledge of allegiance that said under God. There was no, no connection of God and government at all, at least not the true God. Serving in the military was, was unthinkable. To do that, you would have to make an oath to the gods. They hated their government. And the, the whole notion that this government would tax you was, was just grinded them. Jesus said this to people who were taxed into slavery and death. If we don't pay our taxes, we get property confiscated. If they didn't pay their taxes, they would get property confiscated and then they would be sold into slavery, perhaps even executed. Most Jews at this time knew somebody who had 
had that happen to them. They were executed because they couldn't pay their taxes. They were sold into slavery because of that. And we think that we're taxed a lot. The amount of taxes that they had to pay was staggering. And we, we, we do okay. We're, you know, most of us are you know, probably somewhere in the middle class range. right? These people were barely scraping by. But their taxes probably amounted somewhere to about 50% of all of their income. After the Romans taxed their crops and all of the sales tax and their income, they also had to pay taxes to the Jewish authorities, more crop taxes and more for temple and their sacrifices by all of that. Oh, and, and not to mention soldiers who might just stop you on the street and ask for a tip. By the time they were done paying taxes and money to the government, they were probably out half of their income. And they were barely scraping by. Jesus says to pay taxes to these people. But worse, Jesus said this to people who thought their government was an idolatry itself. Their government was basically a false god that was getting in God's way. There had actually been revolts against Rome just overpaying this tax that Jesus was asked about. In fact, it was not that long before this. When Jesus was a little boy, in fact, there was a man named Judas from a town not too far away from Nazareth where Jesus grew up. And this guy basically started a revolt against the tax and said, we can't pay this tax. Look where it's going to. We've got to stand up to these people. God will be with us. Well, that revolt and that entire city was crushed by Roman soldiers. Didn't go over very well, but his, his message kind of struck a chord with people. Look at the kind of people that we're serving. Look at the kind of people we're paying these taxes to. They're not godly people by any means. This guy actually said to pay the tax was to tolerate a mortal sovereign in place of God. And people resonated with that. Jesus was a Galilean also. Is he going to join in this revolt, this tax result, revolt? My, my favorite part here is when Jesus asked them, show me the coin used for paying the tax. We, we're not in that world, so we don't get what's going on necessarily there. But the Roman denarius that he asked for, this was, this was in itself doubly offensive to Jewish people. Just the coin itself was doubly offensive. For, first of all, the denarius carried an image, which is against the second commandment. You shall not make an image in the form of anything in heaven above or on the earth beneath or on the waters below. The coin had an image. That breaks the second commandment. We can't be carrying that. We can't be using that. So I have a picture of the coin there. There's an image of, of Caesar there on the left. That's Tiberius Caesar. That's who was emperor at the time of, of Jesus there. And um, on the other side, on the opposite side, is a is a picture of one of the goddesses that they worshipped, and that's the goddess of peace, or Pax. So you have not only an image of the emperor, you have an image of a false god on your coin. But on top of that, the denarius there declared that Caesar was God. On the coin it said, Caesar is God. And literally, it says, Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. And so, just even carrying this coin was bad, let alone using it. If you were a devout and pious, observant Jew, you would want nothing to do with this coin. Devout Jews would actually refuse to use or carry this coin 
But these Pharisee disciples that were sent to Jesus, they had one. So when Jesus says, show me the coin used for paying the tax. Oh, okay, sure. Oh, look at that. You have one. You're carrying this around. Oh, in the temple courts too, even. You're carrying a false image of a false god that declares that Caesar is God in the temple courts. What do you know about that? They really were hypocrites there. They're carrying this coin when it was a blatant idolatry to most people there. The other thing that's going on here is it says the, they, they brought with him the, the Herodians. So they have the Pharisee disciples and then the Herodians. The Herodians were people who liked King Herod and that, that empire, that monarchy that he established there. These people never got together. The Herodians and the Pharisees, they didn't have anything in common. But they hated Jesus. It's amazing how when we are opposed to, to someone or something, we'll join forces with, with anybody. They say, that, they say that the best way to bring enemies together is to find another enemy. If you look back in the United States history, you look at what sort of other nations that we've paired up against to stand against some other ones. We fought with the Soviet Union against Nazi Germany. We fought with Saddam Hussein against Iran. We are, we've fought alongside Saudi Arabia against Iraq. Enemies create very interesting bedfellows. Jesus is the enemy here. And he has the Herodians and the Pharisees together to try to trap him. You hypocrites. Why are you trying to trap me? Now, they hated their government. Right? Now, there's a lot of things we don't like about our government either. There's a lot of things that we don't agree with. We a lot of things we don't like about it. There's a lot of people in those positions that we really don't like at all. But as bad as we think we have it, the kind of people that were in charge, in power back then, are nothing compared to what we complain about. How many of you have heard of somebody named Caligula? Besides Deirdre, we talked about it this week. One, two, three, four? Raise your hand higher. Oh, okay, okay. One, two, three, four, five, six, six, maybe seven. Okay. Let me just tell you a few things about this emperor of Rome named Caligula. He reigned only for three years, just after the time of Jesus. And uh, yeah, I have a picture of him here. As much as we dislike our government, the Bible says it is God-ordained. Pay taxes to Caesar. I'm not going to read you everything that it says about Caligula here. I'd probably get in trouble for actually saying some of the disgusting things that he did. His biographer said of him, he was not able to control his savage and reprehensible nature Indeed, he showed the keenest interest in witnessing the sufferings and torments of those condemned being tortured. At night, he was in the habit of going out disguised in a wig and a long cloak to indulge in gluttony and adultery. This guy had incestuous relationships with all three of his sisters. He made an alliance with uh, the emperor Tiberius' right-hand man by sleeping with his wife. He celebrated his enthronement um, by having 160,000 people sacrificed in his honor in the gladiatorial games so that he could win the people's approval because they liked to see people killed in the arena and people fighting to the death and animals and other things like that. He poured all kinds of money into that, that operation to get people to like him and lots of people died from it. After about a year of ruling, he had a mental breakdown, and about a month he hovered around life and death, and then when he recovered, 
he said this, I wasn't really ill, I was just being reborn a god. After that, he became even worse. When hecklers booed his underfed lions and middle-aged gladiators, he had them dragged away, tongues cut out, thrown to the hungry lions while he clapped and cheered at everybody being consumed there. When his father-in-law refused to accompany him on a boat trip, he accused him of treason and forced him to cut his own throat. The former emperor's right-hand man, whose wife that he slept with, he charged that man with prostituting his wife, and both were ordered to commit suicide. The supervisor of the gladiatorial games, when he didn't like him, he flogged him with chains for days in his presence, and he only executed him when the smell of gangrene was too much. There was a father that was forced to dine with Caligula after watching his own son's death. Caligula regularly liked to roll in piles of gold. He had his favorite horse in a marble stable and had that horse made one of his counsels. His second wife was stolen from her groom on her wedding day. He quickly divorced her. His third wife was very wealthy, already married. He forced her husband to give her away. He divorced her within a couple weeks and ordered her to remain celibate the rest of her life. I'm going to skip over some of this stuff. He had senators dine with him, he made them wait while he took one of the wives into another room, and then he talked about all of the details about what happened. He had guards seize random people on the streets and empty all of their pockets on pain of death. He opened a brothel in his palace and forced senators to attend, bringing their wives and daughters with them. And maybe the worst of all, he dressed up like the gods themselves. And he made people call him by those gods' name. He'd have conversations with his brother, Jupiter, he ordered a temple to be built to himself in the heart of Rome. He drew plans for all the heads of the gods' statues to be remade with his image on them. And he even said to the people of Jerusalem, you need to have a statue of me in the center of your temple. And when they refused, he ordered the executions of everyone. Fortunately, he was assassinated before that could be carried out. His final words after he was assassinated, or as he was being assassinated, were, I live. This guy thought he was a god and acted like it at the expense of everyone around him. This guy was disgusting. It's awful. We think our politicians are bad. This is the kind of stuff that Jesus said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's? This guy was Caesar. The authorities are God's servants, it says in the Bible. In Romans 13, it says, Everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except that which God's established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Consequently, he who rebels against the authority is rebelling against what God has instituted. This was after Caligula that this was written. And during the time of Nero, who has his own set of disgusting stories. It says the authorities are God's servants. This is your Bible reading track for today. In fact, in this passage, it says it three times. The authorities are God's servants. They're God's servants. God's servants. In 1 Timothy, it says the authorities are to be prayed for. We have to pray for them. It says, I urge then, first of all, that requests, prayers, intercession, and thanksgiving, thanksgiving be made for everyone, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. You're supposed to have thanksgiving for these kinds of people? Really? Whoever our leaders are, whether they're elected or appointed, whether we like them or not, they are worthy of respect in our prayers. That's what the Bible says. I don't like it as any more than any of you do, but that's what it says. 
And they can be terribly reprehensible characters. But it says they are God's servants. Pray for them. Pray for their salvation. In 1 Peter 2, it pretty much says the same thing. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the brotherhood of believers. Fear God. Honor the king. In Acts 24, Paul shows quite a bit of respect to one of the rulers that he has to stand before, a guy who was also really messed up and did a lot of dishonest things. It says that this guy, he was even looking for Paul to give him a bribe so that he would make a favorable judgment. Paul didn't give him one, but he was looking for it. Look at this screen here with me and let's answer this question together. What is God's will for you in the fifth commandment? That I honor, love, and be loyal to my father and mother and all those in authority over me. That I obey and submit to them as is proper when they correct and punish me. And also that I be patient with their failings. For through them, God chooses to rule us. It would be pretty difficult to say something like this and think about this if Caligula was your emperor. He was declaring himself a god and doing all kinds of terribly awful stuff, stuff that we don't even want to repeat. It says in the Bible it's shameful to mention what the disobedient do in secret. That's exactly the case. And Jesus' answer, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar or not? His answer was, give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Jesus is not a political revolutionary. There are some people that I've talked to in my life who wanted to try to make Jesus a political revolutionary. But he wasn't. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Caesar's rule, however corrupt it is, is not a threat to an almighty God. Give to Caesar what's Caesar's. Let him have it. Jesus was not going to be a zealot like that other Galilean of his time. And yet, Jesus would be accused of being against paying taxes to Caesar anyways. In Luke, when he's brought before Pilate, He's accused of being against paying taxes to Caesar, among other things, when he said this. So he would be accused of being against paying taxes, even though he said to pay them. What's striking about what Jesus said here is how he worded it, which doesn't really come out so well in the English translation. He literally says, Give then the things of Caesar to Caesar, and the things of God to God. He's making a contrast here. Jesus differentiates the things of God and the things of Caesar. It's almost like there's two worlds going on here. There's two kinds of ruling, there's two kinds of authority. One is greater than the other. Those things of Caesar, those are things that Jesus never sought. He never sought money, he never sought titles, he never sought political office. He could have easily had any of them. He was the son of God, he could have been born into a royal family in a palace, or one of the families of the high priest. He could have had all of these things, money, titles, and office. He was born in a barn to some people in some nowhere town called Bethlehem that we only know about because he was born there. Jesus never sought these things, but he could have had them easily. And I think that we as Christians, we get easily sucked into the things of Caesar. As if they were the things of God. 
I've had conversations with people where we've said about the taxes that we pay, I don't want my money going to this. I remember in the, in the 90s when I would uh, watch Rush Limbaugh, one of his cur- recurring statements was talking to the government, it ain't your money, would be one of his things that he would say. As Christians, it's not our money either. It may not be the government's money, but if we're Christians, it's not our money either. What did Jesus say to the rich young man? Go, sell everything that you have. Give to the poor. Then you'll have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Now, we don't actually do that, but what the point of that passage is saying is that, hey, if you want to follow me, then everything that you own needs to be under my authority and to submit to me. It's not our money either. When we say, I don't want my money going to, to this, that, or the other thing, for example, let's say to people who aren't working, and I can see why, I don't really want my money going to people who aren't working either, but why do we phrase it that way? Why do we say, I don't want my money going to them? Why don't we say instead, you know, when people aren't working, to just give them money is not good for them. That means we're propping them up. We're enabling them. We're creating dependence. That's not good for those people. Why don't, why don't we say it like that? Because that, that is loving our neighbors. Saying, I don't want my money going to them, that's being about money, our money, my money. Jesus said, give to God what is God's. The things that are of God are the things that Jesus sought. And those were hearts and minds and faith. That's what he preached about constantly. That was what he was exhorting people about constantly. Those were the things that Jesus was about. Those are the things of God. Hearts, minds, and faith. Our hearts belong to God. Or they're supposed to, at least. We need to be more interested in other people's faith than in their votes. There's a discussion group on Facebook that I'll sometimes participate in. And there was somebody who posted something on the election. And of all of the things that we discuss on this Christian theology debate and discussion board, I've never seen people more upset, more impassioned in their arguments than about this election. We talk about all kinds of things about God, how we're to serve him, how we need to love him. And but this is getting the most impassioned pleas from people. Almost like this is what we care about even more. This is more important to us. Jesus was after faith. Our faith is in Christ, right? Why are we afraid? of politics. Why does that make us anxious? I know it makes me anxious. I get that impression from a lot of other people too. Why does it make us anxious? I mean, yeah, there's some big consequences from who our rulers are, but why are we afraid? Psalm 146, the Lord reigns forever. Your God, O Zion, for all generations. God's still in charge, isn't he? There's a quote that I came across that I have on the screen here. Hillary scares me to death. If she wins, Hillary will rule, run the world for perhaps eight years. The very thought of that haunts my nights and days. I'm not going to tell you who said that because... There might be a lynch mob after me because a lot of the view I know like this person. But why would we say something like this?
Why are we afraid? Isn't God the ruler? Does Hillary run the world? If she wins, would she run the world? No. God runs the world. Why would we be scared to death if God is actually running the world? Hebrews 13, 6, we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? That's faith. When we sense anxiety about this election, I want to suggest to you that that's not out of faith. Our fear is not out of faith. Jesus wants our faith. And it's these times of trials and difficulties that really test our faith. Let's make our faith prove to be worth more than gold in these difficult times. And if it's not this, it might be something else. Jesus says this not to just the people of his time. He says this to us too. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. With faith in Jesus, our hope, joy, and peace doesn't rise or fall on the things of Caesar. Our hope and joy and peace does not rise or fall on taxes, on political position, on money, or power, or anything of those Caesar things. Those will come and go. They'll be favorable and unfavorable, but that's not where our hope and joy and peace is. So we're going to vote because we're citizens of a democracy, we have a responsibility, and we have a chance to influence the election, the direction of our country, which has some consequences, sure. But let's not put our faith in our vote. Let's not put our faith in who's in office. Let's not put our faith in politics or in taxes. Cast your vote for Caesar. Give your faith to Jesus. Give to Caesar what is Caesar's. Give to God what is God's. As you cast your vote for Caesar, give your faith to Jesus. Let's bow our heads and let's pray. Lord our God, we we live in anxious times. We hear lots of things on the news. We we see lots of things. And Lord, we are concerned about the direction of our country, what is happening here, and what might happen here. We pray, O Lord, that as we cast our votes, as we seek to to do our civil duty as, as servants in a democracy, we pray, Lord, that our faith would always be in you and that we would not be caught up in the things of Caesar, but that, Lord, we would have our hope, joy, and peace in who you are, which is unchangeable, and that you are our ruler, no matter who is sitting in office. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen.